I don't know if you've had this, but I've had at least one or two ask me if, if the animal got into actual cannabis and we caused them to vomit, uh, they ask, uh, could they get it back? Which is uh, a big, big, big no. I am very excited to have my first guest here today. Uh, she is the first in the world to be double boarded in trauma and toxicology. She is an author. She's a world-renowned speaker, veterinarian, wife, mother, Justine Lee, one of my favorite people in the world. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. You know, you and I are veterinarians, uh, love what we do. You know, everybody has that story about when they decided they want to be a veterinarian. Mine was when I was 11, and my father told me I was horrible at math, but I liked animals, so I couldn't be an engineer, but I could be a veterinarian. Thanks, Dad. Uh, what's your story? So I am probably similar to the majority of veterinarians out there. I knew I wanted to do this since I was seven. And I still remember the story. I was walking with my grandfather. We had lived in New Jersey at this time. And we were walking and we found a baby bird, a fledgling, on the sidewalk. And I looked around, there was no nest anywhere, didn't see the mother bird at all. So being the nurturing kid, I took the baby bird home and my parents put it in, we put it in a box. I dug up earthworms trying to feed this bird and the bird died overnight. And so when I woke up in the morning, found this dead bird in this box, this little nest that I had created, and it really traumatized me. Yeah. So I told my parents that day that when I grew up, I wanted to be a veteran not knowing the terminology. <laughs> and so they gently said, do you mean veterinarian? So ever since I was seven, I knew I wanted to be a vet. I asked my parents at that time, and I still remember sitting around the kitchen table when we had this conversation. And I said to them, what's the best vet school out there? And of course, as, as Chinese immigrant parents, they were gonna name the Ivy League. So they were like Cornell, which you know was a four hour drive away from where yeah. we lived in Jersey. And so ever since I was seven, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to go to Cornell. And is that the only place you applied? So I actually probably applied to 10, 15 schools. I can't remember. Tuskegee was the first school that I got into. So I still uh, remember receiving the letter of acceptance in my dorm at Virginia Tech. Wow. I was so overjoyed. Ended up going to Cornell because most, um, most people aren't aware of this, but not every single state has a veterinary school. And because I was a New Jersey resident, New Jersey at that time had a contract with Cornell, a few other vet schools. Yeah. So I got in-state tuition to go to Cornell, which at that time saved a little bit of money. You know, and um, well, I didn't, I applied to one veterinary school. It was not Cornell. Uh, you know, I, it, it shocks a lot of the younger vets when I tell them this, but when I applied to veterinary school in 87, 1987 at the time, I was convinced, as were a lot of young African Americans, that, I mean, that's where you go. You know, back then, if you saw a black veterinarian somewhere, they almost 99% went to Tuskegee. I graduated from Tuskegee. It's a lot different now. Uh, I have, you know, but it, it was unusual to see a, a black veterinarian from another school. So I didn't know any better. I thought that's the only school I could go to. Some of that was true back then, and it's certainly gotten a lot better now, but um, has there ever been a point where you felt like your veterinary passion went too far? You know, I will say I didn't become a mother until my mid-40s, and I feel really blessed with our one child, but I will say I've always been extremely passionate about the veterinary field, but I had to reel it back when I became a working mom because it made me realize how hard it is to be a working parent, to be able to work full time, still provide for your family and spend good quality time. But I'm just more creative in how I'm going to further my career as a part-time stay-at-home mom and a part-time a working mom. So still trying to figure out the balance of work-life balance. And you know, in veterinary medicine, unfortunately there's a growing prevalence of burnout, compassion fatigue, suicide ideation. It's multifactorial. It's multifactorial from workaholic, driven, perfectionist type personalities who are caregivers, who are putting so much on the line, who have a lot of financial debt, who have a lot of um, stress in life. 
And I will say I'm also very passionate about educating owners, uh, educating veterinary professionals on work-life balance as best I can. You know, uh, perfect, perfect answer. You know, the thing that um, I find sometimes is, you know, clients will ask me, you know, you touched on the stresses in our profession and uh, the ridiculous uh, amount of suicide, the level of suicide we deal with. And some clients have asked me, you know, it just seems like you have the best job in the world. You get to play with dogs and kittens all day and you see puppies. Like, what could be stressful about that? And what they don't understand, even some of the clients that ask that, is that the emotional connection that they have with their pets and when their pets come in and something bad happens and we have to deal with that, the number of times just out of, uh, you know, distress and frustration, they'll blame us. And a lot of people carry that um, with them throughout the day and throughout uh, their careers, and it gets to a point where it's just hard to deal with because, I mean, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, in, in emergency situations, people, people can be pretty callous. Uh, you know, hopefully it's getting better now with uh, there actually being a focus on it and educating people and, you know, helping therapeutically. Uh, hopefully that's something that we can get through. Um, I, I will say most people aren't aware, and I don't even know if you're aware of this, but I really battled with suicide ideation during my first year of my residency at University no, of Pennsylvania. And part of it is I was going through some personal issues, but part of it is also access to euthanasia drugs, right? We euthanize, we talk about quality of life all the time to dog and cat owners or to pet owners, but we oftentimes have poor quality of life ourselves. Again, veterinary professionals are typically workaholics. They've worked really hard to get into vet school. They've worked really hard to become a good vet. And the difference is in human medicine, people are covered by insurance the majority of the time. Right, right. In veterinary medicine, that's not the case. So we often get this pushback where the growing cost of being a small business owner without having insurance and owners being you know, asked to pay thousands of dollars in an emergency situation, there's a lot of negative emotional turmoil from that. There's a lot of negative emotional turmoil from doing economic euthanasia, right? If an owner can't afford it, then having to euthanize a life that was potentially savable. So again, totally multifactorial. Um, I do think it's really important to help increase the awareness of it because there's always a medical stigma within medical professionals of seeking therapy, of seeking support. But I really think that we veterinarians, we veterinary technicians have really embraced taking care of each other, especially after our year and a half of COVID, right? Trying to be a really good veterinarian while trying to work from home, homeschool your kid at the same time when schools are closed, keep your family healthy. So it's been a rough year, but it's been really incredible to see the veterinary professional surround themselves with support and encouragement. Well said, well said. Um, you and I worked on a project together and uh, you were well known as Vet Girl. Can you explain a little bit sure. to the vets and non-vets out there sure. what that is? So back in 2012, I started a company called Vet Girl. And up to 2012, most of the time when veterinarians, veterinary technicians needed to get continuing medical education, they had to travel to a conference. And I actually came up with the idea in 2003. I was studying for the equivalent of a bar exam mm -hmm. for my specialty. And while I was studying for it, I'm not a good test taker. So I had to study, you know, 12, 13 hours a day. And I just wanted someone to read me a journal article on a Walkman, which most people don't know what, it, what that is anymore. But I just wanted to be able to learn while I was multitasking, while I was going for a run or going for a dog walk. And so came up with the idea in 2003. When I was studying for my toxicology boards in 2011, that's when I came up with that idea again. I was like, I just want someone to read me an article. You know, we always joke we want to learn by osmosis. We want to sleep on a textbook so it gets into our head. I, I tried that. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. work. It doesn't work. <laughs> I tried hard. Yes. Yeah. So in 2012, I partnered with a fellow criticalist, and we released Vet Girl, which is online continuing medical education to veterinary professionals. And so we provide continuing education so people can learn through our online source. And since then, it's been a really, really uh, rapid growth. We really pride ourselves on being clinicians, so we know what veterinarians need to know. 
in order to save that patient's life. So we really pride ourselves on clinically relevant, practical, continuing education. And so I've been doing it since 2013. And you know, you are, I know you well enough to know you're not one to toot your own horn, but Vet Girl is a rock star in the veterinary community. I have veterinarians that work with me who are dying to be here right now. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we just went through a pandemic and everybody was doing a lot of things online. Mm -hmm. And Vet Girl, you know, for those who don't know, veterinarians have to get a certain amount of continuing education credits in order to keep their license. You have to keep learning because things change. Um, I would imagine during the pandemic, Vet Girl uh, went up. I'm not going to lie. COVID was good for a vet girl because all the veterinary conferences were canceled. Yes. So people weren't traveling. We all had to learn by webinar or by Zoom. And so that actually was just, it happened to be perfect timing and that we provide continuing education. So we saw a lot of growth just because vets have to get 20 hours a year for the most part. Do you, you know, a lot of veterinarians are allergic to cats and, and some dogs. Do you have any allergies to pets at all? Because my wife and I are both allergic to cats. Wow. Yeah. So... No. Thanks, I'm thankfully, Zyrtec and, and allergy shots get us through it. But you, none for you? None for me. I will say I'm occasionally sniffly after handling rabbits. But thankfully, I haven't developed any allergies. There's actually, and this is really important for cat owners, most cat owners aren't aware, there's a new diet by Purina. Have you heard of Live Clear? No, no. So Live Clear is this new diet. You can buy it over the counter. And this is actually a pet food that a lot of human allergists were shocked by and worked in conjunction with Purina on. Mm. When you feed Live Clear diet and adjust your cat to it as a sole diet, it decreases the molecule FEL-D1 right. that's shed in the sal salivary glands of a cat. So when you feed it, it actually makes you as a human less allergic to your cat. Wow. And it cuts down on the FEL-D1 by a about 47% within a couple of weeks. So. It was really interesting to, to discover that. You are the expert in um, veterinary emergency toxicology. That's you. What, are there, what things can you share that pet owners would be shocked or toxic to their dogs or cats? All the common household toxins that I see, most pet owners know about. They know about some of the you know, sprays, chemicals, things in the garage. What they don't know about are food items. You and I, we can eat anything in the kitchen, not gonna be poison danger, but most people are surprised. I didn't even know grapes and raisins were poisonous until 2001. So back in 2001, the ASPCA, in conjunction with the University of Illinois, discovered that dogs that were eating anything from the vitis species, grapes or raisins, and some rare species of currants, could cause kidney damage to their dogs. I used to pill my childhood dog for 13 years of his life, his medication in a grape every single day, and he never had any issue with it. So I think that's one of the biggest shockers, grapes and raisins, trail mix with raisins in it, you know, cereal with raisins in it, yeah. all pose a danger. Most pet owners know chocolate is poisonous. And honestly, that's probably overhyped because I've had poor owners who come in, they pay the $150 exam fee in the veterinary ER. They come up to me and they say, my dog ate two chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. No big they, deal. They right? two Hershey's kisses. Yes. It's the dose that makes the poison. Yeah. I always say as a toxicologist, everything in the world is poisonous. It's the dose that makes the poison. Water's poisonous. Salt is poisonous. It's just the dose. So again, with chocolate, there's different amounts of theobromine. Now, my most hated poison that a lot of cat owners don't know about, anything from the lilium species. So these are true lilies. So Easter lilies, Asiatic lilies, Japanese show lilies, some species of day lilies. And I always t tell cat owners, you can never or you should never bring in a fresh cut bouquet of flowers from a florist or from your garden. One of the reasons I'm so passionate about educating pet owners or cat owners about lily dangers is because the kitten that I gave my sister ended up dying of kidney failure. Yeah, right. This was really frustrating. She called me. She knows she gets 24-7 advice to a vet all the time. And she called me and she said, hey, Oscar's been lying in the litter box. He hasn't used the box in two days. And I thought he had a urinary blockage. Well, it turns out her roommate's boyfriend had sent a bouquet of flowers and Oscar had eaten two to three leaves. 
and it ended up shutting down his kidneys. His kidney levels were 20 times higher than they should be. He was in what we call annual kidney failure. Both his kidneys had shut down. He ended up dying from it at Animal Medical oh. Center in New York. So I am always still shocked that cat owners don't know that these plants are so dangerous. Even as little as two to three leaves, the water in the vase can kill a cat. Oh, you just have to take um, heat that it could be anything. Uh, you know, and as a GP, every now and again, we have a 24-hour practice. Every now and again, I either go and help with an ER shift or I will take an ER shift. And uh, what we see here a lot in the South, and particularly during this time of the year, is inevitably somebody comes in with an animal who's walking around like it's drunk and you have to get it out of them and you finally find out that he ate an edible or he ate uh, some of the cannabis laying around. Do you see a lot of that in the Midwest where, where you are? Yes. So with the decriminalization of medicinal marijuana, we veterinarians are seeing way more marijuana or THC poisoning. And I always tell people, we are not the DEA. We are right. not going to report you to the police. Right. All we care about is fixing your dog. And I will say as a toxicologist, 90% of the time when I see animals getting into it, it's usually dogs. It's accidental. They eat the bud directly. They eat an edible. They eat pop brownies. Always trust your veterinarian, right? You, we want to find out what's going on. It can be really dangerous. In severe cases, it can be fatal, especially with pot butter because it's so concentrated. Right. So if whenever you notice that a dog or a cat has gotten into something poisonous, my advice is you want to get to the vet or the emergency vet right away. With any poisoning, the sooner you diagnose it, the sooner we figure out what's going on, the less dangerous it is to your dog or cat, the cheaper it is for you, and the faster the outcome. So when in doubt, it's okay to admit and say straight out, my dog ate a pot brownie. We can take care of it. We're not going to report you. We only care about taking care of your pet. Oh, I mean, I have to tell them all the time. I'm like, I am not the police. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not going, you're not going to jail. We just have to figure out what's going on with your pet. And um, I don't know if you've had this, but I've had at least one or two ask me if, if the animal got into actual cannabis and we cause them to vomit, uh, they ask, uh, could they get it back? Which is uh, a big, big, big no. 